We're going to continue on in chapter 13 with the path of the blood flow through the heart. There are two main circuits of blood flow through the body. So there's the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. So make sure you star these. These are really important. The pulmonary circuit is going to pump blood from the right side of the heart to the lungs and then back to the left side. And then the systemic circuit is going to pump blood from the left side of the heart out to the body and then back to the right side of the heart. Here's a picture showing the pulmonary circuit. So the pulmonary circuit starts on the right side of the heart and we're going to be pumping deoxygenated blood that's been returned from the body and we're going to pump it out through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs where we're going to do gas exchange in the lung capillaries, pick up the oxygen, drop off the carbon dioxide, and then the oxygenated blood will then flow through the pulmonary veins and be returned to the left side of the heart. So normally we think of arteries being red and veins being blue, which is true in the systemic circuit, which we're going to talk about next. But in the pulmonary circuit, it's just the opposite. So pulmonary arteries are going to be blue in color because they're carrying deoxygenated blood. And then pulmonary veins are red in color because they're carrying the oxygenated blood. We're going to look at the blood flow in the systemic circuit in a picture on the next slide. But one thing just to point out is that if you take a look at a cross section of the heart here, looking at the ventricles, you can see that the wall of the left ventricle is a lot thicker than the wall of the right ventricle. And that's because the left ventricle is going to be pumping the oxygenated blood out to the rest of the body. So it has to pump the blood a lot farther distance than the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart only has to pump blood out to the lungs, which is very close by to the heart. So if you're pumping a, a much farther distance, there's a lot more resistance to blood flow. And so you're going to have to create a much higher pressure um, coming out of that left ventricle. So that's why the walls are a lot thicker in the left ventricle. Here's a picture uh, showing the systemic circuit. So systemic circuit is going to start with the left side of the heart and the left ventricle is going to pump the oxygenated blood out through the aorta and then out to the rest of the body. So we'll do the gas exchange in the tissues, dropping off the oxygen, picking up the carbon dioxide, and then the deoxygenated blood will return back towards the right side of the heart through the vena cava. So that's the systemic circuit. All right, so start with this. This is really important. Um, blood is going to be flowing through the pulmonary and the systemic circuits in series. So it's just saying that we go from the pulmonary circuit to the systemic circuit, back to the pulmonary circuit, to the systemic circuit. So we're just going in series from one to the next to the next. But if you're looking just inside, for example, the systemic circuit, the blood is going to be flowing in parallel. And we're going to be taking a look at a, a picture of this in just a minute. Um, but let's just list the advantages of blood flowing in parallel through the systemic circuit. So the first advantage is that it makes sure that all of the organs get enough oxygen. And then the second advantage is that it allows you to regulate the blood flow to different organs depending on their activity. So for example, if you start exercising, you can increase the blood flow to the skeletal muscles and then decrease the blood flow to the GI tract. So the two advantages for blood flowing in parallel through the systemic circuit the first one is it makes sure that all of the organs get enough oxygen. And the second one is that it allows the body to regulate the blood flow to the different organs. So you can increase or decrease blood flow to the organ depending on its activity. So the reason that I have the picture of the candy over here on the bottom left 
um, is let's say that I've got a big bowl of candy and let's say that I start passing it around the room and each person can take however many candy bars that they want. And so maybe the first person just takes two candy bars, but maybe the next person is really hungry and they take 10 candy bars. And you can imagine by the time the bowl gets to the back of the room, there's probably no candy bars left. So that would be an example of flowing in series where you're just going from one to the next to the next. So we do not want to flow in series within the systemic circuit because if you are having blood flowing from like the um, heart and then going to the kidneys and then finally the skeletal muscle and then the liver, you're going to have somebody at the end of the line that is not going to get enough oxygen. So in order to make sure that each of the organs get enough oxygen, we're going to divide the blood flow up. Um, so it'd be like if we divided the bowl of candy up and we put the candy into little bags and then we passed a bag out to each person in the room, everybody would get enough candy. So that's the same thing that we do with the organs. We're just going to divide that oxygenated blood up in the systemic circuit and make sure that each organ gets enough oxygen. So here's an example of just showing you blood flowing um, both in series and in parallel. So remember series uh, flow is you're just flowing from one organ to the next. So you can see our pulmonary circuit is up here on top and then here on the bottom would be our systemic circuit. So you can see that the blood is going to be flowing from the pulmonary circuit to the systemic circuit back to the pulmonary circuit, systemic circuit. So that would be series flow. But then if you look inside the systemic circuit here, you can see how coming off the aorta, we've got all of these arteries that are branching off. That is blood flow in parallel. So you can see that the blood is flowing parallel to each other to the different organs. So the reason that we have this parallel blood flow within the systemic circuit like that is that it makes sure that each of our organs are going to get enough oxygen. So if we divide up all that oxygen and blood and then pass that out to each of the organs, everybody will get enough oxygen. And then also it allows us to regulate the blood flow of the different organs depending on their activity level. So if you start exercising, you could increase the blood flow of the skeletal muscle and then decrease the blood flow to the GI tract because usually you're probably not eating while you're exercising. Okay, we also have um, coronary arteries and veins. Um, these are going to be supplying the blood flow to the cardiac muscle cells. Um, and that's because the cardiac muscle cells, there's a layer of epithelial tissue in between the, the blood that's in the chambers and the cardiac muscle cells. So they can't access any of the, the blood that's inside the chambers. So they have to have their own blood supply. And it's really important to supply the cardiac muscle with blood because it's working really hard and um, is basically just using the mitochondria to do um, to make the ATP so it needs a lot of oxygen. Um, unfortunately, we can have a blockage of the coronary artery and that will cause a myocardial infarction, um, also abbreviated an MI. Um, which is better known as a heart attack. And that's where we block blood flow through one of the coronary arteries. And then that area of the heart muscle on the other side will die. So here's just a picture just showing you the coronary circulation. So you can see there's a left coronary artery that's going to supply the left side of the heart. And then there's a right coronary artery that will supply the right side of the heart. And notice that these coronary arteries are coming right off of the aorta. So they're the first ones to branch off. Um, they got their name coronary arteries because coronary means crown. And they thought it looked like a crown of blood vessels that were sitting on top of the, the heart there. Okay, this is um, called an angiogram where they've injected some fluorescent dye into the patient 
and they take an x-ray and you can actually see the fluorescent dye flowing through these coronary arteries. And any place where it's narrowed, you can actually see that there's a, a partial blockage there. So it hasn't completely blocked yet because there's still dye that's able to pass through that and get to um, the other branches here but this is a heart attack waiting to happen. And so they probably would place a stent um, in that coronary artery to keep that open and prevent it from getting blocked and causing a heart attack. So this is what happens in a heart attack. So you can see that our coronary artery here, we've got a blockage. Um, what happens is that over time, we get these fatty plaques that build up the atherosclerosis. And what can happen is that they can rupture, which will cause a blood clot to form over the ruptured area. And then that will block the blood flow completely um, through that coronary artery. And then whatever part of the heart muscle is on the other side does not receive any blood flow and no oxygen. And those heart cells will then die. So that's what happens in a heart attack. Here's a picture of heart attack pain locations. So remember that the heart being a visceral organ is innervated by the C fibers. And remember the C fibers create that slow pain and that's harder to localize. Um, so it's, it's hard to say exactly where the pain's coming from. And then we also get that referred pain. So you can even end up with pain that shows up in the, the left shoulder and down the left arm as well. Um, you do not need to memorize these signs of a heart attack, um, but I would just read through these um, because you're going to see these again in your healthcare classes. And also, if you have a family member or friend experience a heart attack, you'd at least recognize what's happening. Um, one thing that's important to note is that with women, <laughs> Um, they tend to have different signs of a heart attack than men do. Um, women tend to get more um, abdominal pain, kind of indigestion feeling, and so they may not recognize that they're actually having a heart, heart attack. And then the other thing that's scary is that about a quarter of patients that have a heart attack actually have no symptoms at all, and so they don't even know that they've had one. All right, the next thing um, in the path of the blood flow through the heart is we have heart valves. Uh, the valves are really important. They keep the blood flowing one way through the heart. You do not want the blood flowing backwards through the heart. So like, for example, you wouldn't want the blood that is just returned to the right side of the heart that's all deoxygenated. You wouldn't want that flowing backwards and going back to the tissues because there's not much oxygen in it. Um, I would start this. It's really important to note that the valves will open and close due to pressure differences. So if the pressure is higher in the area before the valve, the valve opens. And then when the pressure is higher in the area after the valve, then the valve will close. So there's four valves that are inside the heart. We have two AV valves and two semilunar valves. The two AV valves, um, these are between the atria and ventricles. So we have one on the right side and one on the left side. Um, the right AV valve is also known as the tricuspid valve. And the left AV valve has two other names. I'm sorry about that. Um, also called the bicuspid valve and the mitral valve. I do want you to know all of these names because if you're in medicine, they will use any of these names. So you'll see all of them used. And then the semilunar valves, um, we have one between the left ventricle and the aorta, the aortic semilunar valve. And then the pulmonary semilunar valve, that's between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. So I do want you to know the blood circulation path through the heart, including where all the valves are located. Um, so I've drawn a picture of this here. Um, so it's just a really simple picture of the heart, but you can see the right atrium and the right ventricle here. Um, in medicine, we always look at 
um, x-rays, they're always backwards. And so even in our drawings, we have everything's backwards. So something that's normally on the left side will be on the right. And, and so it, it ends up being backwards of what you would think that it would be. So just kind of get used to that. Um, so here we're just showing you the deoxygenated blood coming back to the right side of the heart through the vena cava. So remember there's an inferior and a superior vena cava. I won't ask you that, but if you've had anatomy, you've learned that. And then they're going to dump the blood into the right atrium. And then the blood from the right atrium will go through the right AV valve, also called the tricuspid valve. The way I remember that is I just remember that the word tricuspid Tri has an R in it, and I remember that goes with the right AV valve. So if you have another way to remember that, you know, maybe you have a better way, but that's how I remember it. Um, so from the right atrium, the blood will flow through the right AV valve to the right ventricle. The right ventricle contracts, and then that higher pressure in the right ventricle will flip open the pulmonary semilunar valve. And then blood will throw, flow out through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. And then we'll do the gas exchange in the lung capillaries. And then the oxygen and blood will flow through the pulmonary vein and then be returned to the left side of the heart. Okay, so that's all of the pulmonary circuit involving the right side of the heart and blood flowing to and from the lungs. Okay, and then the left side of the heart we're gonna have the oxygen and blood entering into the left atrium. It will then flow down through the left AV valve, also called the bicuspid valve or mitral valve. And then it will go into the left ventricle. When the left ventricle contracts, that'll open up the aortic semilunar valve and the blood will then flow out into the aorta and then out into the body tissues to the capillaries, we'll do our gas exchange, and then the deoxygenated blood will flow back through the vena cava back to the right side of the heart. So that's showing you the systemic circuit, um, starting with the left side of the heart, and then going out through the aorta to the rest of the body, and then the blood returning to the right side of the heart. So questions that I could ask on the test, um, I could have a question where I say, you know, maybe the blood is sitting in the right atrium, where does it go next? And then you'd have to tell me that it would then flow through the right AV valve to the right ventricle, um, and that would be the pathway. And then here's just a, a better picture of um, the valves of the heart. So you can see on the right side here, we've got the right atrium, right ventricle, and you can see the right AV valve or tricuspid valve there. Um, it's called the tricuspid valve because it has three um, valve leaflets. So three cusps or, or leaflets there. And then here's the pulmonary semilunar valve here between the right ventricle and then the pulmonary artery. And then on the left side of the heart, you've got the left atrium and left ventricle. And then here's the left AV valve, also called the bicuspid or mitral valve. So it got that name because it has two leaflets or two cusps. And it got the word mitral valve because a bishop's hat, which is called a mitre, um, it looks like it has two cusps or leaflets on it. So when they were figuring out the anatomy of the human body um, way back when, they, they thought it looked like a bishop's mitre or a bishop's hat, and so that's where a mitral valve came from. And then from the left ventricle um, out into the aorta, right between there, you've got the aortic semilunar valve. Okay, with the AV valve, um, when the ventricle contracts, it creates quite a bit of pressure and that will slam the AV valve closed, but we don't want that high pressure in the ventricle to pop the AV valve back open 
and evert it back into the, the atrium. So to prevent the, the valve from um, leaking and letting the blood flow backwards and making sure it stays closed, we have the papillary muscles here um, on the walls of the ventricles and they're attached to some connective tissue here called the chordae tendinae, which will then connect to the leaflets of the AV valves. And so when the ventricle contracts, it's also going to contract these papillary muscles, which will then pull on the chordae tendinae, and that'll prevent the valve leaflets on the AV valves from everting backwards and letting blood flow backwards into the atria. The semilunar valves do not have any chordae tendinae or papillary muscles. Um, so here's just showing you the aortic semilunar valve, and it's open right now because the pressure is much higher in the left ventricle, it's contracting. And when the left ventricle relaxes, its pressure decreases, and the pressure in the aorta is now higher than in the ventricles, so that will close the aortic semilunar valve.